This is the world's biggest supercomputer located in Kobe, Japan. In it, there are over 48 million gigabytes of memory and a processor that performs 442 quadrillion floating point operations per second. That's a lot of semiconductors. Other than huge supercomputers, semiconductors are also in our smartphones, personal computers, iPads, washing machines, and even refrigerators. They are everywhere. But in recent years, problems started surfacing, starting with the China-US struggle for supremacy and then with the chip shortage last year. It affected all of our lives. In this video, I want to talk about the semiconductor business. How does the business work? Why is there a global chip shortage? And crucially, what can we expect from the industry? This video will explain the fundamental logic of the industry, untangle the intricate interdependencies among players, and share a few crucial industry developments that are going to define our world in the coming decades. So I recommend everyone to really watch this video till the end to understand the industry structure as a whole. I promise you will have a much deeper understanding of semiconductors at the end of the video. For those of you who are curious for more, be sure to subscribe to my newsletter, Disrupted, for an in-depth analysis on Singapore's semiconductor boom as a result of the global chip shortage I'm about to explain today. It would be a great addition to today's video. Let's dive in. In 1908, a boy named John Bardeen was born in Madison, Wisconsin to an ordinary family. Little do his parents know, in the coming decades, Little John would lead an extraordinarily accomplished life as a scientist, including two Nobel Prizes. Like most scientists in his age, after surviving World War II, John started his work in a research lab. This is where he met his colleague, Walter Britton. On December 23rd, 1947, an ordinary day when they were doing experiments as usual, they discovered something interesting. That when two gold point contacts were applied to a crystal of germanium, a signal was produced with the output power greater than the input. They called it the transistor effect. They did not know it then, but transistors later became the building blocks of all chips we use today. They got a Nobel Prize for it. Another key moment of the semiconductor industry happened when Masatoshi Shima invented the first Intel processor with only 2300 transistors. After seeing the great computational potential of this technology, Intel doubled down on it. Under the observation of what's called Moore's Law, which predicts the number of transistors and processing speed of an IC doubles every two years, the industry exploded. Today, the state-of-the-art Apple M1 chip has over 16 billion transistors in it, starting from a humble beginning of 2300 transistors in the first Intel chip. This is the power of exponential growth. But of course, the history of semiconductors and the story of John Bardeen and Masatoshi Shima is a story of inventors and technologies. They're credited for the technology, but the money doesn't go to them. The true players behind these inventions are the companies. And that goes to the core of today's video. Companies as key players behind the global chip shortage. The semiconductor industry is complex. This is the value chain that captures what the industry is about. Three core steps are involved. Design, manufacturing, and OSAT. There are two business models in this industry. Companies either do everything from design to manufacturing to testing, in which case it's called IDM model, or it follows the fabulous model, which focuses on doing one thing really well and outsourcing the others. Intel and Samsung are two big IDMs around the world. Most other players like Nvidia, Apple, and TSMC follow the fabulous model. Taking Apple as an example, to make its state-of-the-art M1 chip, the process goes like this. I want to skip through all the admin details behind the story because it involves hiring the key personnel, investment and acquisitions, such as Apple's acquisition of the Israeli fabulous chip designer Anobit and setting up R&D centers in Israel in 2008, which is widely believed to be the brain behind the M1 chip. But that would make this video too long. Long story short, after Tim Cook decide that the M1 chip is a go, the first step is to design the chip. Two independent elements are involved. IPs, intellectual property, licensing, and EDAs, electronic design automation tools. These two are essential to making powerful processors that exist in our modern computers. These are the software architectures and the brain behind designing a modern chip. 
The second step is fabrication, which involves buying the machines, the chemicals and wafers for chip production. Fabrication is the production process and the above mentioned are the necessary components for production. The last step is testing and assembly. Over the years, the fabrication process has grown to become incredibly complex. Remember the Morse law I mentioned where transistors count doubles virtually every two years? Well, no one would be able to put 16 billion transistors on Apple's M1 chip if the transistors didn't get incredibly small. To fit more transistors to improve processing speed, Foundries has developed nanometer technologies over the years to make transistors tiny. Starting with a few hundred nanometers, now the state-of-the-art technology builds 5 nanometer transistors on the M1 chip. That is why M1 at its size can host 16 billion transistors per chip. So this is the basic framework of the semiconductors industry. You have three different business segments that go into the process design, fabrication, and testing. And you also have five different types of suppliers that are fundamental to the production. That is the IP, EDA, the chemicals, the machines, and wafers. And here's another important element we need to understand about the semiconductor industry. It is a complex and capital intensive work the industry has consolidated to have a concentration power in a few big players in the past decades. The EDA tools provider, for example, essentially has only three players based in the United States, Cadence Design Systems, Synopsis, and Mentor. The foundry business is at the moment dominated by TSMC, which takes over 50% of overall industry revenue. The chemicals are dominated by the Japanese and the wafers are essentially supplied by five big names that controls 90% of the market. ASML's EUV machine is essentially a monopoly in the market for machines. You probably noticed that I mentioned a few of these elements that are dominated by companies in one country. And that is the reason behind the geopolitical tensions, but that is a topic for another video. Coming back to the semiconductor business, this incredible interdependence is the first reason behind the global chip shortage. No country in the world can control the entire supply chain and everyone depends on everyone else to make semiconductors. What that means is that it is incredibly hard to ramp up production, as McKenzie noted. If Apple wants to create an iPhone with a new 3 nanometer processor, it cannot do it alone. It had to work with TSMC in Taiwan for fabrication, and TSMC must also work with Dutch companies company ASML to purchase the machines and with Japanese companies for the chemicals and wafers, and this is not a simple game of coordination either. It's research and breakthrough. Apple's chip design team may be able to design a chip with 3 nanometer technology, TSMC and ASML still need to invest in R&D and building new factories to make that a reality. TSMC spent an estimated $20 billion for a 3 nanometer foundry in Taiwan in 2019. We can only imagine the commitment and risk. Anyways, this is the first reason for the global chip shortage. It's about supply. The fact that it is incredibly hard to ramp up supply because of the capital commitment and associated risks. Secondly, COVID has also brought incredible demand problems for the semiconductor industry. A McKinsey report that spelled out the forecast versus actual sales in the semiconductor industry in 2020. It shows that consumer electronics among various other products categories has grown by 15% more than forecasted growth. Demand for more semiconductor products was not anticipated. This meant the lack of production capability going into 2020. Everyone now is working on full gears to increase capacity, but as I explained in the supply side, it ain't easy. Lastly, various strong industry factors also exacerbated the increase in semiconductor demand. Two in particular are robust. The demand for chips in the AI and auto application sector has grown strongly over the years due to the geopolitics. Many Chinese vendors are also stockpiling chips to save up for a rainy day. I'm talking about a potential US sanction, of course. Since Chinese vendors are dominant in the area of smartphones, PCs, AI, and EV, this created the incredible semiconductor demand we saw in 2020. The combination of a strong demand and the lack of growth in supply resulted in the global chip shortage today. 
uh, by the way, guys, this is the end of the video, but this is only the first installment of my analysis on semiconductors. So be sure to subscribe to this channel if, if you're not subscribed, like this video and turn on the bell button, which is very important nowadays for YouTube algorithm to, to know that you like my video. I'll see you in the next one.